The Christian life is not complicated. It isn't easy, but it's not complicated. Um, Jesus reduced how to live the Christian life to obedience to two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Uh, and so Jesus came to earth because we do not do either of those things because we are sinners. And he came to bring us to God, to forgive our sins and enable us to keep two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. And so throughout the Bible, we have uh, God showing us what he in Christ has done for us so that we can love God and love our neighbor the way we are created to do. This pattern is very common throughout the scriptures. Um, probably the book of Romans is the most difficult book to master uh, in the scriptures, um, certainly in the New Testament. But the outline's not that difficult. I like reducing things to make it sound easy, even though the book of Romans is difficult. But chapter 1 to 11 of Romans is what God has done in Christ to save us. And chapter 12 to 15, 16 being mostly closing remarks, but chapters 12 to 15 is how we respond to that once we come to know Christ. So the gospel is chapters 1 to 11. And our response as saved people is chapters 12 to 15. Here's what God has done. Here how you should, here's how you should respond. Ephesians is like that too. Chapters 1 to 3, what God in Christ has done to save us. And then uh, beginning in chapter 4, therefore walk worthy of your calling. Romans 12 starts with, Therefore, in light of God's mercy, and here's the mercy of God, here's what you were, here's what he is, here's what he has done for you, and therefore, do not be conformed to this world. Therefore, in Ephesians 4, walk worthy of your calling, keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see it in a, a briefer passage uh, in Titus chapter 3. Um, Verses, verses 3 to 8. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regener regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us richly. You, you hear all the things that God did. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I, want you, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Here's what God has done. And those who have received that should be careful to do good works. Um, First Peter chapter 2. Uh, Robert and I and... Uh, the other elders as well, Paul and Isaac. We're going to go through 1 Peter, starting sometime soon. And 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies. Do you hear it? Here's what God has done. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I urge you as sojourners and exiles saved by Christ to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, amongst ungodly people, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Here's what God has done. He has done this for you. You have come to Christ. Here's how you should respond. God has done a very great thing, an unimaginably great thing, and here is how you should respond. You find that all through the scriptures. Um, and... Throughout the New Testament, 
this is a favorite theme of mine, and you might get tired of me saying it, but throughout the New Testament especially, but not just, but it, it blares throughout the New Testament, is that our response is never big, grandiose stuff. You will not find in the New Testament, this is the great, unbelievably, unimaginably great thing that God has done. Therefore, go out and walk on water. Do great miracles. Do great things. It's not. When Paul starts chapter 4 of Ephesians, it is walk worthy of your calling. Be completely humble and gentle. In the book of Colossians, it is persevere, be patient, and be joyful. And so our response is not to a huge, humongously big thing that God has done is not what we normally think is a humongously big thing. I say this a lot in my preaching, and if you're growing tired of it, good, that means you're getting it. But I, I preached, I said this comment at, at, at Thistletown, where I was a pastor one time, and I said that the the call is not to walk on water. The call is to be humble and gentle. And a man came up to me after church. He said it would be easier to walk on water. And, and sometimes that's true. But he was getting it anyway. Um, and so we see that in, in, the, in the, the verse that Pastor Les uh, was going to have for us as our theme this year. And then he bowls off, so, you know, we can just... Um, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Here's what God has done. Walk worthy of it. And the worthy walk is to stand firm in one spirit, have one mind and strive for the faith of the gospel. Boiled down, the Davis paraphrase would be, here's the great thing God has done. Now get along. And that's the response. The text we read this morning follows this pattern. You have what God has done in verses 1 to 4 of 2 Peter 1. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. His divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So he has given us a faith in Jesus Christ. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And beginning in verse 5 says, For this very reason, make every effort. Here's what God has done. Here's how you should respond. So, point the first. What God in Christ has done for us, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. To those who have obtained a faith. He has given us our faith. To those who have received, obtained a faith. The faith we have whereby we believe in Jesus Christ to save us is not ours by nature. We have obtained it. It is a gift. The very fact that you believe has been granted by God. God gave it to you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for him. Two things God gives us. Philippians 1.29. He has given us faith granted to you that you believe and he's granted to us that we should suffer for him. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself, it, the salvation, is a gift of God. So the first thing that Peter says to us as he begins this letter is, 
I am writing to you as believers because you have received, obtained a faith in Jesus Christ. That's not all he's done in verse 1. And this, <laughs> this, is, this is where we start getting into the gobsmackiness of what God has done. The stunningness. I, 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 I wrestle around for words. I use um, stunning a lot. Um, I, I wrestle for the right kind of adjectives. But this is a stunning thing here. We read our Bibles in the morning, you know, and we got a bagel in one hand, and we sort of try to get through it and before the bus comes or before we have to get off to work or whatever. And it doesn't always grab us. And I think that's part of the purpose of preaching is just to help you slow down and get grabbed by this. Listen to this. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. This faith that God gives us and saves us is not of less value to God than the faith that Peter has. He has given you a faith of equal standing with ours. Who's the hour? The hour is Peter. And the apostles, you have a faith that God views of equal standing with Peter and Paul and John and James and Nathaniel and Bartholomew and Philip, all the apostles, of equal standing with them. Now, just to help that grab you a little bit, we read Ephesians 2. 19 and 20. You are no longer strangers and aliens from God, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The apostles are the founders of the church. They set the foundation of the body of Christ in the world for all of time until Jesus comes. They wrote the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when God looks at their faith and then looks at your faith, he considers both theirs and yours of equal worth. You may sit down now and take a breath. This is amazing. The faith of the apostles and our faith are gifts from God that God highly values. And he doesn't look at Peter and say, well, I'm glad you're around. Because if I only had the faith of Ken Davis, it would be a pretty sad state. He looks at Peter and says to Peter, Ken Davis, that Ken Davis has a faith that I value just as much as I value yours. Stand and be gobsmacked. Is that how you see your faith? That's not how you see your faith. Not often. I want you to at least get it in there. Peter said it. God said it through Peter, and it is true. God does not consider your faith to be inferior to the faith of the Apostle Peter. Now we're talking about saving faith. We are not talking about the demonstration of faith. I have no doubt that Peter demonstrated his faith in Christ better than I ever have. But that's not what we're talking about. Being a child of God is a matter of trusting Christ. And all who trust in Christ have the standing of a loved child before God who has saved them. The apostle Peter is a sinner saved by grace. When, and without that grace, he would have gone to hell as a guilty sinner. And you are a sinner 
saved by grace if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And he loves you. And the apostle Peter, he loves. And he loves you both as sinners in need of a faith put upon Jesus Christ, which will save. And you have done that like Peter did that. And he values your faith just as much as he values Peter's. Guys, gals, that's great stuff. That is good news. And this faith and standing before God that we have, God values. But it doesn't stop there. To those who have obtained as a gift a faith of equal standing with ours, but the apostles, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Great comment there, just a little bonus point. Jesus Christ is God, says so right there. Okay, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a faith of equal standing with the apostles by the righteousness of our God. Now, the reason God values this faith that is ours and Peter's is this. It is the righteousness of his son. We have no righteousness of our own. Finish the verse for me. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. How can he look at me with a righteousness that is a filthy rag and call it equal to the apostle Peter's? Because it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ counted to me. He credits me with the sinless, perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he credited Peter with it too. And when he looks at me and Peter, what he sees is the sinless righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're going to the table this morning, and that's what was accomplished. We're going to heaven, not because we are righteous, but because he is. And that's a glory. That makes it shake just before you drink it. This is stunning. We need to be sinlessly clean in order to get to glory. And that is what he has done. And the reason he can do that is because Jesus paid the penalty. And when we put our faith in him, he treats us as if we were or we had the sinless righteousness of Christ. A little account from Zechariah. I'll try to finish up shortly. Eight pages of notes here this morning, folks. I'm on page three, so don't worry. We'll... <laughs> We'll just stop when the time comes. Okay. Zechariah chapter 3. Listen to this. Listen to this. Then he, that is an angel. An angel is showing Zechariah a heavenly vision or a vision. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. There's the high priest standing before God. There's Satan right next to him saying, oh yeah, you call him a high priest. He did this. He said that. He thought this. All these kind of, he's accusing the high priest. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? That's us. Brand plucked from the fire. And to him he said, to Joshua the high priest, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. What garments? His. Clothed them with his garments. It's the parable of the prodigal son. The son comes back. The father's looking for him, sees him, runs out to get him. The prodigal son goes through his little spiel that he had practiced. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm unfit to even be a hired servant. Father won't have any of it. Calls his servants and it says in the parable, go get the best robe. Who owns the best robe in the house? The father does. Go get my robe and put it on him. And that's what God has done. We are... Recipients of a faith of equal standing with the apostles by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are robed in his righteousness. What else has he done? It just keeps going on. Verse 3. 
Don't, I, maybe I shouldn't skip verse 2, but that's what I'm doing. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. This boils down to this. I'm going to shorten this up. The NIV, I like the way the NIV puts it. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So he gives you a faith of equal standing with the apostles and clothes you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself so that when he looks at you, that's what he sees in a saving sense. And then he says, this world is no friend of grace to lead you to me. I will give you everything you need to live a godly life in this world. Dear ones, if you are going to celebrate the fact that God has saved you, you had better be able to show the world that he has granted you the power to live a godly life. When professing believers are embroiled in sin, what will the world see? They won't see him. But this text says he has given us everything we need. That means, dear ones, at the very least, you don't need more of God to live a godly life. You don't need better gifts. You don't need for your faith to grow more. You don't need a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. You don't need a better spouse. If only I had a better spouse, then I could be godly. No, no. He has given you everything you need. You don't need better circumstances. Oh, Ken, what do you know about my circumstances? I know this. God has, his divine power has granted you all things pertaining to life and godliness. When we do 1 Peter, we'll see it in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 1. Almost the same thing. You don't need an easier life. You don't need a harder life. You don't need a more satisfying life. You don't need a richer life. You now have all you need in order to live a God-honoring, God-pleasing, God-directed life. It says it right there. Through the knowledge of him who called us. By his own glory and goodness. God has done an amazing thing. So what? And we won't get into the so what. The so what runs from verse 5 to 11, and we just don't have time to go there. But this, so we read verse 1, obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Then you get to verse 5, for this very reason... Because God has done all this for you. This is a stunning thing. Grace is free, free, free. But then see what this says. Because God has done all this, make every effort. It is not like so many think. Grace is free. Then go live like the devil. Right? Grace is free. Don't worry about anything. He's given me faith. He's given me, credited me with the righteousness of Christ. Wow. If, I'm, if he looks at me and sees Christ, then I can just go for it and do whatever I please and get to heaven too. No, Peter says, that's not how this works at all. The way this works is this. Look at what God has done and be gobsmacked. And if you're truly stunned at what this is, you're not going to say, I can live like the devil. You're not going to say, I can just carouse around and do what the world is doing. You're not going to think like that at all. You're going to be so amazed at what God has done that you will want to live a life that pleases him. It's a mark of faith. And so Peter says, since God has done all this, make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to add to your virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control steadfastness and to steadfastness godliness and to godliness brotherly affection and to brotherly affection love there's the mark of really having obtained a faith that we make every effort first point eh, too late for first points but this this 
since you came to Christ, how easy have you found it to live a holy life? You dare raise your hand to that. You're the first one in 2,000 years of Christian history. And that's why Peter says, make every effort. And Christians will. And this is the common theme of the whole New Testament. Listen to Paul in Philippians 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's a man who has understood the grace of God and what God has done for him, and I will not be satisfied until I am completely like him. That's the mark of faith. I discipline my body, Paul says, and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You'll never do it perfectly, but this is our goal. We strive, Luke 13, 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. Romans 14, 19, let us pursue what makes for peace. Ephesians 4, 3, we are eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. 1 Timothy 6, O oh, man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness. Hebrews 4.11, let us therefore strive to enter. Hebrews 12, let us lay aside and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12.14, strive to be at peace with everyone. That's the Christian life, folks. Christian life is not a walk. In a garden of peace, it is a dead serious putting on of spiritual armor and fighting to the death. And he has given us everything we need, we just looked at, so that we can do that. So we just close with this. What has he given us? He's given us, when we came to faith, the Holy Spirit. We are God in us to do and will of his own good pleasure. He has given us prayer. I can't do this. Ask God to help me. He has given us this table. The early church was devoted to the breaking of bread. To find the strength and the grace of God that he has provided with us as we sit around. And the final thing he has given us that we, I think, neglect the most. He has given us each other. You're going to make every effort all by yourself? We will sit back and watch you fail. Because you can't do it all by yourself. You're not designed to do it. He has given us everything we need. He has given us himself in us. He's given us prayer. He's given us the Lord's Supper and worship services and so on. And he has given me you. So that I will not fall. So that I can add to my faith virtue and to virtue goodness and the goodness self-control and that whole list that's there. What in the world God has done? He has given us a faith of equal standing with the apostles according to the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Therefore, dear ones, let us make every effort to add so that we would be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. And let us use everything that he has given us, asking the Holy Spirit for power and grace, praying to God to enable us to do it, and relying upon each other in our struggles in the Christian life. God bless you. Yeah, we'll sing now. No? Okay. <laughs>